my business today is not remotely what it was 20 years ago. When Christine and I got married, I'm not the same person. Christine's not the same person. Boy, did I make some mistakes. I did not know how to do things. I can blame it on youth, and I can also blame it on just being dumb. I didn't know how to do things. And instead of trying to find out, I tried to rush the process. I'm not going to go and find out how to, I don't know, file for taxes. I'm just going to hope it works itself out. That is not how taxes work. Figure that out, though. I'm still paying for that mistake, huh, babe? 18 years later, we're still paying for taxes from 18 years ago. Mistakes were made in my youth. Mistakes continue to be made now. The only difference is that I have learned some things. I've grown a little bit. My resolve is a little stronger. My relationship with my wife is definitely more fortified because I am in the process. And during the process, God is strengthening you, teaching you, evolving you. Because you know what? You might not be able to handle the promise 18 years ago. You might need to be a better version of yourself. You might need to be in a different place with a different person at a different job before that promise can be realized. Right? That's the process. We all have dreams and aspirations and goals. Everyone here, I hope. Right? I'm looking around. Anybody like shaking their head no? Hmm? <laughs> God prepares you for that promise. Does everyone here believe that God has a promise for their lives? Is there anyone in this house right now that thinks that God doesn't have a promise for them and they're just figuring it out? Does everyone here believe God has a promise? Okay. <clears throat> So why does that promise take so long? Because the process. So I have found that during these times of waiting in my own life, God is preparing us. We are learning, we're growing, we're evolving. Our insights are becoming clear. We are being prepared for things to come. We are being prepared for the promise. And that promise might only last a day and then you graduate. It might. That might be God's plan for you. But this world is temporary, so if that's God's plan for you and it's, and it's seen through, then awesome. You fulfilled your plan. Your promise has been realized. Before you start doubting the process, you need to realize that everyone around you here today, everyone at your job, everyone in your family, everyone online, whichever camera, everyone has experienced the same hardships and setbacks, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you why I quoted that, setbacks that you've experienced. Different degrees of setbacks, perhaps. Different degrees of hardships and frustration. God is only going to give you what you can handle. If you are living in God's bubble and you are living in his um, obedience, then you will know that his promise is being fulfilled to you. He's going to throw anything he has to throw at you to get you prepared for that promise. So, Before I get into the scripture, I just want, to know, want you to know that God has a promise for everyone here. And it doesn't matter what, what a person, what men say or do, what your job says or does. God's plan for you is going to happen no matter what. A man, a person, can, circumstance cannot derail God's plan. If it feels like your plan, maybe you don't know what your plan is, but if it feels like your life is being derailed, your promise is being robbed from you, your blessing is being robbed, you got to understand that you're in the process. And you got to trust the process. So let's look at 1 Samuel 16.1. I just wanted to prepare everyone for this next for this scripture. Because it's interesting, uh, David, King David, you know, the guy that killed Goliath, one of the most, probably after Jesus, the most famous person in the Bible, even atheists know David is. He had a promise, right? God appointed him. God said, this is the plan for your life. This is what I'm going to do for you. Before that process came to be, he was herding sheep. He was the lowest of his, of his brothers, right? Of his family. 1 Samuel 16, 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? 
since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Okay. So prophet Samuel was mad that he chose the wrong person to be king of Israel. He was frustrated. And God was like, hey, man, get your oil. Go to Bethlehem. We're going to work this out. Because, again, if you're going through it, if you're going through trouble, God's fixing it. It's in the process. I'm going to say it one more time. If God's done with you, you won't wake up tomorrow. Right? So if you're waking up, no matter how, how bad it seems to, to have gotten, if you're waking up, the process is still happening. God's plan is still being fulfilled. But Samuel said, if I go, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, a cow, cow, not a large lady. Take a cow with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? <laughs> Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw, saw Eliab. Oh, I got that right. And thought, surely the Lord's anointing stands here before the Lord. The oldest, strongest, tallest brother, right? But, Samuel said to us, but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man, if you are feeling... Now, you are not worthy of God's promise. Now, you, are, you do not have what it takes. You are not good enough. You are not Christian, Christian enough. You are not righteous enough. You are not rich enough. Whatever it is, if you feel that way, it's wrong. Your heart is what God's looking at. Not what you look like. Not what you're, how much money you have. Not how smart you are. None of that. You guys probably know by now, I have a pretty hefty speech impediment. Right? I mumble a lot. I'm dyslexic. I can't read correctly. It's a physically, if it requires physical effort for me to read on this tablet, and the words are huge, let me tell you. But what is my job? My job, what God has given me for a job, is talking about nerd stuff to nerds on the internet. Regardless of how much I mumble, how much I can't read, how much names I get incorrect. God has still given me a job that I enjoy, even though I physically shouldn't be doing it. Right? My brother, on the other hand, he was blessed with a golden voice. God was like, you know, your voice is not great, but your brother's voice is pretty good. So you guys need to work together. Moses and Aaron. Thank you, Ben. Mom. I almost called him babe. My pet. So close. You guys are like... Um... So God looks at the heart, not the height, not what, they look, not what people look at, the outward appearance, how much money you have doesn't matter. God looks at the heart, period, the end, full stop. Your heart, is your heart good? You know that. You're going to know if you're in the right place. Then Jesse called, look at this, this now, Abinadab, 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 Abinadab. Sounds like a restaurant I went to once. Then Jesse called in Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema. Man, David had the easiest name here. Shema passed by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Jesse answered, There is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. 
Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on the Spirit of Lord, I'm sorry, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel went to some other town. Okay. All right. They found David. They anointed him. God says, this will be the king of Israel. Thank you. <laughs> but then David went back to the field to tend sheep. Anyone? What, what's going on here? God, master of the universe, up, anointed David and said, he is the king. And then David said, cool, man, thanks. I got to go. Cool. Wouldn't go ten sheep. So why wouldn't David take the throne immediately? Now, if the story was a movie, that would have happened. David would have marched in there and fire from heaven would have, you know, burned Saul alive or something. He would have taken the his muscles rippling, would have taken the throne and what that cool shot where he puts the staff down and he's like, yeah, I'm David. But this is real life. So David goes back to watching the sheep. Why did David, why did the process take so long? What was the point of anointing David if he had to wait anyways to become king? Well, <laughs> it's a great question. David, it wasn't just David that still needed had work to do. It wasn't just the fact that Saul had to be removed peaceably. There had to be a process of events in order to get David to the throne. But David wasn't even done growing yet. In the fields, tending sheep is when he started, he learned how to write music. When he was anointed, he wasn't singing God's praises. The book of Psalms wouldn't exist if David didn't go back to the field to tend sheep. Consider that for a minute. First Samuel 6, 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. It's like a guitar. Okay? Who can play the guitar. I'm just going to say guitar because no one knows what that is. He will play... When the evil spirit from, from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent the messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the sheep. Oh, my goodness. See how it's playing out? It was while David was tending sheep that he learned how to play right music. In Psalms 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Preparation has to come before the opportunity. If you are not prepared for God's promise, then the promise will not be fulfilled. You have to trust God's process. 1 Samuel 17, 32. Real quick, before I go in there, just pull that up. Are you guys not getting this? So, God anoints David to be king. And then Samuel leaves. David goes back to his job. His his rough job, tending sheep, fighting lions, right? Bears, becoming strong, be learning music, basking in the glory of God, becoming the man that was meant to take the throne. He could not, at that moment, 
take the throne. He was not ready. That time in the field turned him into the man he was when he did eventually take the throne. And before that moment, even then, God was like, hey, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna mess with the king to the point where he wants someone to play music. And then I'm going to suggest the guy that's going to take his throne, the new king. He's going to actually invite David into his throne room because the music David learned while tending sheep after being anointed as king. Oh, man. So in 1 Samuel 17, 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose account on this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Okay. And before we go further, this, this is all a setup. So God anoints David. God starts reaching into Saul's heart saying, get someone to play music. The Philistines come to cause some trouble. Get someone to fight the Philistines. God is slowly putting David in charge of all these important tasks. He's becoming not only important, but imperative to the kingdom of Israel. They, they need him. He's becoming the king before getting the title. He doesn't even have the title yet, and he's already doing the job of the king, right? And he says, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, and that's very important, David was a servant. He knew he was a servant. He is living in obedience. I am a servant, and I will go fight him. I am your servant, and I will go fight this Philistine, this 13-foot tall dude. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. See, that's when Saul made a mistake. See, Saul was doubting the process. Saul was doubting God. God put David there. Saul was doubting it. This is why Saul, even if he's a good guy, because you know, if, if you look at the scriptures, Saul seemed like a nice guy. Before he was king, everyone liked him. He was charming. He was tall, sort of smart. He wasn't a bad guy. He just didn't have the heart of a king. He didn't have the heart of a warrior because he doubted God. And he doubted God's process constantly. David did not. So Saul told him, you can't do it. This guy's been a warrior since he was a kid and you're just, you're just a little guy. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. <laughs> a lion. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Why? Because he defies the armies of the living God. Man, this guy, is, this guy should write political speeches. This uncircumcised Philistine will be just like the lion or the bear that I killed with my bare hands. Woo! Again, though, the preparation had to come before the opportunity. We all know the end, end of that story. David takes his sling that he used to fend off wolves. So when he was tending sheep, he would have a sling. Right? And what did he use the sling for? He just played with it? No, no. It's when the wolves came to eat the sheep, he would scare the wolves away with the sling. He became so good while tending sheep at throwing stones with the, with the sling that he was able to stand before this dude in full armor, 12-foot, massive, I don't know, massive dude who's been a warrior since he was a kid. He has a spear and a sword and armor and a helmet. He got so adept with this sling while tending sheep, while waiting for his promise. He got so good at using that sling, he was able to take that giant down with one single blow. And the words he says before, everyone in Israel heard it. He hears, sorry, heard it, heard it. Everyone. When he said, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you with the power of God, and he throws that thing, Imagine the soldiers, right, that hears, hears that. Now, they're going back to the town. They're like, dude, this David guy's insane. L listen to what he said. It's like, it's like a movie line. They're probably excited. 
this guy's awesome. This guy should be the next king. And they start talking. Guess what? Guess who has the armies in his pockets now? David. Because of a talent he learned while, while waiting for his opportunity. While tending sheep, waiting for his opportunity. This is interesting. Like, a, a lot of people really focus on the big parts of the story. But I, you got to look deeper because the fact that David didn't cry and go, but I was supposed to be king. Right? God anointed me to be king. I should be king right now. Come on, Dad. Come on, Samuel. No, no. He's like, okay. Thanks, God. I'm going to go tend sheep. I'm going to go tend sheep and write songs about how good God is while working in the fields, doing the lowest job, the most dangerous job they had at the time. I'm going to go tend the sheep and thank God for every moment I am breathing. Think about that. That's when he wrote songs. He learned music. Learned how to fight bears and lions. I mean, without the waiting, there'd be no preparation. Without preparation, that giant would have walked up and stepped on David. David wouldn't even have made it in the throne room. He wouldn't have even had the opportunity to defeat the giant because he wouldn't have known guitar. So while he would have been complaining about being in the field and not learning how to, re- how to play guitar, not learning how to write, write and play music, he wouldn't even have made it in the throne room. But he did. Made it in the throne room, and then he was given the opportunity to defeat the giant, and then he used the same skills he had while tending sheep to destroy the giant, thus fulfilling a portion of God's promise. You cannot shortcut the process. If you shortcut the process, you'll short circuit the product. You're the product. You don't want to short circuit the product, right? David chose to prepare. We need to make sure that we know that we are in the process, that our preparation is part of the plan and God's promise will be fulfilled. And even if that promise is you reaching one of your, your kids for the, for, for the Lord and then dying in your sleep that night, that might be your only purpose. And if that's it, hey, awesome. Not everyone is called to do crazy great things because what's the definition of great? What's your version of great? You got to understand, the, everyone believes they're the hero of their story, right? They're the main character. Some of us aren't. Some of us, maybe I'm just an obedient servant. And that's okay. That's fine with me. As long as I get to graduate. Right? As long as the plan is is realized. And no one can derail God's plan. Only you can do that by doubting, by not trusting the process. I want us to pray. The dominion that the devil has in your life, the doubt the frustration, the I'm not good enough, my wife's not good enough, my kids aren't good enough, my job's not good enough, that stuff right there, it's got to stop. It's got to stop because you are delaying your purpose. You are delaying the promise. You got to let God work. You got to be obedient. You got to trust the process. I love you guys. Thank you.